In preparation for my exhibition at Yorkshire Sculpture Park, I wanted to make a number of very simple discs of clay. Plates, really. Or dishes or platters. I'm not sure how best to call them, really. And this is compounded by the fact that during the show they're going to be used to display behind pots, meaning they'll have more of a decorative function, acting almost like a backdrop or a frame for the pots placed in front of them. As for the throwing of these, they are very simple objects, although what you see here isn't one of them, rather it's the bat of clay I'll be attaching my wooden bats onto. It's thrown roughly, scraped flat, and then a series of grooves are pressed into it. These help the MDF stick to the clay whilst also being rather hypnotic. With the bat thrown, I'll now prepare the clay for the actual plate, for which I'll be using about 2.2 kilograms. And this is important for a shape like this, I'm going to be using very, very soft clay, as there's no height in this pot whatsoever. It's just going to be a flat disc. So the clay really doesn't need any strength to support the walls, and it being so soft and malleable will just make centering and throwing the pot easier. To attach the bat, I dampen the underside, tap center it, and then shift it back and forth firmly to make sure it's really stuck. If it slides off easily when you do this, then it definitely isn't stuck down hard enough. And lastly, I lightly dampen a patch on the bat, as this will really help the lump of clay stick down onto it. To begin with, to make sure the lump of clay is really stuck onto the bat, I squeeze with my little fingers around the base to create a seal. It's then forced up into a rough cone and the top is rounded, and then the piece of stoneware is coned up and down more thoroughly. This helps to align the particles that make up the body, and it can sort of be seen almost like wedging on the wheel. From this point, when the lump of clay is spinning very smoothly beneath my hands, I begin to gradually press it into a disc that gets ever thinner and wider. I want to leave these purposefully thick. This way, I can trim them to my exact liking once they're leather hard. I use a sponge to apply pressure to a wider area to even the top out. A rolling pin works really well for this too. And then all that's left is to scrape the top and sides clean. A process that doesn't need much of an explanation. This soft disc of clay is then pried off the wheel. And from this point on, I'll leave it for a couple of days to dry out very slowly under plastic so it firms up evenly. I find it easier to wire these pots off from a standing position like this. The following day, once the plate has dried out somewhat, I begin by pressing a groove in all the way around the base. And then I brace the bat with my knee, hold the twisted metal wire very tightly. Then whilst keeping it taut, I slide it underneath the pot. And from this point, I will only ever flip the plate between two bats like this. With the leather hard plates wired off, the excess clay is scraped off the bat and the leftover sticky slithers are used to pick up any leftover specks of clay on the workbench. And as this leftover clay is really thin, it can immediately be thrown back into my reclaim bucket to be recycled. I left some of the plates on the bats for too long, which means they've warped slightly. To fix this, I wash them on both sides and if the warping is only very minor, I dry them upright like this. But if the bend is considerably worse, I'll lay something heavy on it and leave it for a day or two. Now, trimming these really is the easy part. As the disc of clay is so flat and heavy, it's going to hold itself down and stay in place really well. And I'll begin by turning the top to be slightly concave, much like the tops of the lids I make. This way it's easier to glaze them thickly on top, as the hollow helps the glaze to pull as they're dipped into it. In many ways, these discs are like blank canvases of clay. I threw them thick intentionally, and all that excess material means I can trim whichever shape I like without having to worry about running out of stoneware. I 
I place a ruler on top to quickly check the depth of the hollow and then continue trimming to make it slightly deeper. I then burnish over and smooth all of the marks left by the trimming. Then, to flip the pot over, I place another bat on top of it and turn it over like so. It's just much safer doing it this way round as compared to simply picking the dish up and flipping it over by hand, as with flatware like this. If the pieces are bent unnecessarily so at the leather hard stage, the clay's memory can remember that even if you fix it. And once fired, the pot could either distort massively or a crack could appear where that bend was. In most cases, you may get away with it, but you'll find that some clays are worse than others and mistreatment of the pot at this stage will just come back to bite you later on. Next, I'll be turning the rim of this piece, or at least thinning out that portion of the disc. And to hold the vessel down for this, I'm going to be using a spinner atop a bat to apply downward pressure. And then the most satisfying bit of trimming can occur. If I were trimming more of these, I'd place a basin on the floor to catch these trimmings, but they're easy enough to pick up and place right into the reclaim bucket to my left. I want the overhang to be significant enough so that I can easily lift the plate up when it's placed the right way up. I also don't want the base to be visible. This way the plate will look almost as if it's floating, hovering just above the tabletop. As for the base itself, I'll be trimming it flat with perhaps a very slight indent. This way the plate should sit flat once fired, as otherwise, without a proper foot ring, you run the risk of the pot spinning on a high point right in the middle of the base. And there's nothing more annoying than flatware that doesn't sit flat, or if it spins or rocks in place when used. Just like the top, it's then burnished smooth and stamped with my maker's mark. I then flip it back over, again between two bats to avoid distorting the shape. At this point, I noticed that the curved surface had bowed inward slightly. Not by a lot, but there was a sort of flat section in the center. So I softly pushed it back down and then ran my kidney over the surface, compressing it. I also double checked the rim at this stage to ensure that it was crisp and smooth all the way around. I then let these flat dishes dry very slowly over a couple of weeks beneath plastic as to avoid any warping. And then when I had enough pots to fill the electric kiln for a bisque firing, I packed it tightly with a whole variety of shapes. And for this firing, as it's still a relatively low temperature, the pots can be stacked and they can touch as I don't have to worry about anything sticking together. Really, the greatest cause of concern is accidentally damaging a pot by placing it in too aggressively or knocking the base of a pot against the rim of another. As bone dry pots before they've been fired are exceptionally fragile, yet once they've been fired, the pots can be picked up and handled without the same concern, although they still are delicate and if squeezed or bent too hard, they'll crack, especially with the more thinly trimmed pots. Most notably though, the clay has now turned into ceramic, a material that's now stiff and hard and cannot be recycled back into a slurry if left in water. Instead, the body is now porous, meaning that water will be drawn into it like a sponge, which is ultimately what we need in order to glaze them. But first, I'll be coating the basis of these in wax. To make this easier for myself, I'll be waxing the pot on a raised platform. This way the pot can be easily removed once finished, and I won't have to struggle getting my fingernails under the rim in order to pry the plate off. I then brush this watered down wax emulsion all over the bottom, which ended up taking much longer than I imagined. It also uses up a ton of wax, but it's worth it as it should mean I spend less time tidying up the bottom of the pot after it's been glazed. I ended up just pouring the wax in the middle and then spreading it out from there, which definitely sped this process up. I just had to be very careful not to accidentally spill any on the underside of the lip as I really don't want to faff around removing it and fixing it at this stage. If I did get wax where I didn't want it, I blast it with a heat gun until it all burns away and evaporates, and then I sand the area smooth, just to make sure there's no waxy residue left. The other option is to bisque fire the piece again, which, if you have the time, is probably the best way to do it. 
And with the waxing done, next up is glazing. Here I'm mixing a batch of glaze that had settled as it had sat unused for a couple of months and the heavier raw materials and water have separated. And so before any pot can be dipped into it, it first needs to be very thoroughly mixed. The glazing is otherwise simple. The plate is gripped firmly and slid into the mixture. It's held there for four or five seconds and then it's slowly drawn out and I maneuver it quickly the right way up to try and catch as much glaze on the top of the pot as I can. I then take it with my left hand from underneath and hold it aloft for a few moments so the glaze can dry, after which it's slid onto a wearboard whereupon it will be left for a day or two to fully dry out. Now, when tidying up a pot like this, where so much dust is created, I always wear a mask. I use one of these 3M respirators, which I can attach these filters onto. These 2097 filters should protect you from most airborne particles. And even when I have this on, I often open the windows and the door of my studio to properly ventilate the space, as the dry, raw materials that make up glaze can hang around in the air for quite some time. And whilst it isn't the most comfortable thing to wear, especially in the summer, this should hopefully prevent me from ever developing silicosis, or potter's rot, as it's sometimes called. As for the surface of these, I scrape away any drips or high points, with my aim being to create a very flush, smooth surface on top. I then flip the plate over very carefully onto a pad of foam and set it down gently on the banding wheel. And you can see all the specks of glaze which I need to remove from the bottom. I then take a wet sponge and begin to wipe over the base, removing the more stubborn, stuck bits of glaze, before really focusing on making the line where glaze and clay meet as crisp and perfect as I'm able. As, like I always say, with this specific glaze, the neater and better the surface is at this point, the better it's going to look once reduction fired. I need the white glaze to finish in a very straight line on this curve, as opposed to settling in a more wavering one, so I spend an awful amount of time carefully scraping away any excess glaze to achieve that, whilst at the same time being careful not to remove too much glaze, as a thin patch will look watery, the colour not right, the defect almost worse than a very wavering line of glaze. It's worth noting that this specific crackle glaze barely moves once fired, and it only ever really begins to move past where it's been applied if it's been coated on way too thickly, or I've overfired the kiln. As I clean up, I accumulate all the excess dust and then scrape it into this basin of water, which I'll later sieve into my larger buckets of glaze, thus reusing it. Throughout the course of a year, I'll probably add about three of these back to my larger buckets of glaze per colour, which really is a considerable amount. And then, like always, the area I was working in is given a really thorough wash. Next. I load the plate into my gas kiln alongside all the other pots, positioned in such a way that its edges don't overhang too much, as its thin lip could be prone to warping if exposed to the brunt of the flame during the firing. The kiln is then lit early the following morning, with the gas pressure kept very low for the first two or three hours, so that the temperature increases gradually. Once I'm confident that all four burners are lit, I swing the door closed and seal it tight. As a rule, when firing gas kilns like this, you must light them with the kiln's door open. This way, unignited gas can't build up in the chamber and then suddenly be ignited, which in some cases can cause an explosion. A few hours later, at precisely 860 degrees Celsius, I initiate the reduction atmosphere by sliding the damper to be half closed, increasing the gas pressure and the air pressure. With the flues throttled, the excess fuel inside the chamber simply cannot burn efficiently, as there simply isn't enough oxygen, and, as a result, the burning atmosphere ends up stripping oxygen from inside the clay and glazes themselves, and it's this which creates the colours that are particular to kilns fired in a reduction atmosphere. Once the kiln reaches 1290 degrees Celsius, I can switch the gas off and the kiln can begin to cool down, which normally takes about 36 hours or so.
Speaking of protective equipment, these are the goggles I use to look at the pyrometric cones through the spy holes in the door. It can still be relatively difficult, especially when the flames are swirling about inside, but it's another necessity to protect yourself. Two days later, and the kiln is now cool enough to unpack. And here's one of the three platters I made, although in reality, the other two were fired in a subsequent kiln load of work. Before I can look at them properly, I first need to sand the back of each of them, as inevitably, even though burnished smooth, the stoneware shrinks more than the grog it contains, so the once smooth surface becomes rough. And this quick sand using a diamond tool's diamond pad just takes the edge off, so the pot won't scratch any tabletop it's placed on in the future. So here they are, in three colours, white, pale green and dark green. All in all, I was actually really impressed with how these fired, even more so by the strange shapes on the underside, which are presumably echoes of pots once fired on that same kiln shelf, but I've never seen them to this extent before, and despite it introducing a kind of irregular pattern to the backs of these, I really adore the story it tells. Each of these stayed lovely and flat, and the crackle glaze mostly settled into a very even surface, although the rims did droop slightly, which makes the top surface feel slightly rounded, but I don't mind. These were being made as backdrops, almost, with pots to be placed in front of them, like so, for my exhibition at Yorkshire Sculpture Park, and many thanks to India Hobson for this beautiful photo. You should definitely check her work out, and I'll leave a link to her website in the description below. And for the rest of this video, I'll include a few high resolution pictures I took before the pots were wrapped up and shipped up north. These platters or dishes or plates were really enjoyable to make, and I want to produce some larger versions with trimmed backs so the pieces can be hung and displayed on a wall to make them even more of a decorative piece. That could make a fun series here on YouTube. Let me know what you think. And a huge thanks to everybody who's watched this far and made it to the end. It really means a lot. I'll see you next week.